Next question is from Fabrice, also from last week. I notice a lot of movement with the thoughts such as, am I doing this right? Should I ask the inquiry question again or the ego trying to get an outcome during the practice? How do we differentiate if we are still inquiring on the question or get lost in our thinking? Do you, for example, keep the breath as an anchor to claim to calm the mind? And this is in regards to how to prevent thinking from distracting our self-inquiry. Yeah, great question, Fabrice. Um, I'll start with the last question you asked, which is, do you use the breath as an anchor? Oh, yes. The breath is the most important anchor, I think, for us in meditation when we notice the mind trying to carry us away. The breath, I haven't found anything more effective than the breath. I'll put it that way. Just to, to reorient us towards focus and concentration. Now, when you said, I noticed a lot, I noticed a lot of movement within the thought, within thoughts, such as, am I doing this right? Um, should I ask the inquiry question again? That's all normal. This is all very normal, what the mind does when we're inquiring. The, the best advice I can give to anyone for self-inquiry is deep childlike curiosity. Can you go back to that as often as possible? Because inquiry really isn't a mental exercise. The doors of the universe don't open unless we knock with genuine deep interest and curiosity, because that is the demonstration of our free will, right? I really want to know. And if, we're, if the ego is knocking on the door, ego only wants to know so it can have a new spiritual concept, right, to weaponize. And so source won't open to the ego's knocking. In fact, ego can't really even knock on that door, right? Source doesn't even hear that because it's not coming from a genuine reality. Ego will want to know who am I so it can become self-realized and become enlightened and all this stuff. So can you pay attention to where the question's coming from? Is it coming from an, a spiritual ego that really wants to have a, a powerful self-inquiry experience? Or is it coming from a deep, genuine, burning curiosity that I must know who I am? I got to know. Nothing else matters to me until I, until I answer this question. Why should I care about anything else until I know who I am? Who am I really? Am I really this body? Am I really this person, this limited avatar with only so many personalities and responses? Like That doesn't feel like who I am. If I'm not that limited person, that body, the mind, if I'm not these things, who am I? Like that needs to be alive in you when you do self-inquiry. So I would say, don't even do self-inquiry. Don't even, don't even try to engage with it unless some of that is there. Otherwise, it just becomes another kind of mental masturbation technique for ego to get off on and say, well, I did a really great self-inquiry today, but it's not a technique, right? It's not a method. It's not a, a conceptual exercise. We're not looking for a conceptual answer when we, when self-inquiry happens, let's say it that way. It's, it's supposed to be what we all experienced in our opening meditation. I guided you through some, some questions to contemplate. And because you were looking at those questions with real curiosity, you connected to a truth in yourself that gave you an experience of that reality, right? The, the substratum, the source of what I am is emanating from. Like sunlight is emanating from the sun, right? That's the source of sunlight. Well, I am is like sunlight, a, a, a ray of light, a beam of light coming from that, that wordless, nameless, formless reality upon which everything else depends. The earliest thing that can possibly exist. The, the part of source that's so innocent, it doesn't even know I am. That's how early it is. It just is all existence. It just is all that is, but it doesn't even know it. It's, uh, it's the jawbreaker analogy, right? 
it's, it's hard for the mind to quantify how the source can both not know itself and know itself in the universe because our mind is so bound in time. It, it tries to make it a sequence of events, right? So first there was the source and the source didn't know itself and it, it didn't even know I am, it just is. But then somehow that source thought of a question, who am I? And then the big bang happened and the universe was formed. And then in that universe, the source began to learn about what it is. Nope, that's not how it works. It's like a jawbreaker or an onion, let's say, which there's many layers and all the layers exist simultaneously, right? But that innermost layer, that core of what the source is, is that absolute reality that is before even the knowledge I am. The knowledge I am emanates from that source, that absolute. So when we're doing self-inquiry, we're trying to connect to that. Even just to connect to the sense I am is also self-inquiry. Ramana Maharshi and Nizargadatta both said, all you have to do is hold on tenaciously to the knowledge I am. Because it's really on behalf of I am that the whole universe appears to you. You know, you open your eyes in the morning and the sense I am creates the universe. Or we could say the universe appears to I am. It's like I am is the eternal witness of the show, the, the eternal audience member. And the universe is dancing on the stage, performing and acting for I am. Without the I, the universe cannot exist. So really you are the source of everything. That I am sense in you is what the universe itself emanates from. But likewise, the I am also emanates to, from something earlier than itself. You'll never, ever connect to that if you're just trying to do it as a mental exercise. There has to be a deep interest in this question, almost like I can't leave my house until I find out. I can't do anything else. My mind cannot be satisfied with anything else until I know the answer to this question. If, if that's alive in you, self-inquiry happens automatically. You know, just that level of intrigue will make these realizations happen. You'll just connect to it, right? The second the question happens within you, you, you dive deep into the center of your being and you see something in yourself that you cannot put words to, but you cannot deny it. That's where self-inquiry is leading us. So really self-inquiry happens in us, and this is what Romano would say as well, self-inquiry happens in us naturally as we're, we're cultivating this desire, this curiosity, this childlike interest in who am I? Who am I really? Ever since I've had experience in this body, I have known I am. But what is that? What is this I that knows it exists? That's self-inquiry. Even just that interest itself is self-inquiry. And the mind can't want that. You know, the mind can't have that interest. The mind wants to know form. The mind wants to know certainty. The mind wants to know what it can weigh and measure on a scale. So it's very quick to dismiss anything it can't. This is why we have trouble connecting to I am. Because as soon as we try to meditate on it, our mind starts chirping and going, I am. What is that? That's like not even a thing. I can hold it. I can't hold it in my hand. Like what a waste of time to think about I am. And it tries to gaslight you, right? And get you to dismiss this I am as insignificant. If I can't see it, if I don't know what color it is, how much it weighs, what do I care? That's what the mind says. So the mind's never the one that's curious. Who am I? You are, right? The, the spirit, the self in you is curious. And so kind of like a little flame, if you're trying to start a fire, right? You're, you're doing the fire starter stick on the, on the wheel on the stone, and you're trying to grind enough friction to get some smoke. And then the smoke appears and you're, you're trying to blow on it to get the flames to kindle. That's what self-inquiry really is. It's this cultivation of the interest, the, the burning desire, almost like a fever in us that we can't, we can't calm it that needs to know who I am. We want to actually let that burn brighter and hotter. 
We can, we can use every experience we have in daily life to lead us to that. When we experience pleasure, we go, who, who's experiencing this pleasure? Like, who is, where is the pleasure going? It's going to a sense of an eye that's experiencing it. Who is that self? What is that self? Or if there's pain, whose pain is this? Who's so interested in this story? And you'll notice you never actually find an entity that says, I am. You know, you just, you just find more painful thoughts. So you're looking inside yourself for the I who suffers, and you just find thoughts. You go, okay, so there's just thoughts that are creating an experience of suffering, but I don't find a self who is suffering, just thoughts, just feelings. You know, the feeling itself is what we call suffering, sadness, anger, or fear. So who am I that can know all this stuff? What, what witnessing principle is aware that there's an emotion happening and is behind that emotion? Like, what is that? That's an amazing question to ponder, right? If you can use every experience to lead you back to that question, that, that's what Ramana Maharshi called self-abidance. You're, you're so interested in who you really are and living from that place that everything that happens to you basically is pulling you back to that question. And as you're pulled to that question, to the degree you're pulled to that question, the experience, the realization of the answer will start to happen. We can say it that way. So in the way of that, let's take a minute to close our eyes. And I want to give you a few points of contemplation. <clears throat> Beginning with the fact that the truth of self is not in the mind. The truth of self is not in the mind. Which means the truth of myself is not a thought or an idea. It's not even a feeling. Thoughts may point me towards myself. Feelings may reflect myself. But my real self is beyond both of these. My real self is earlier. And so that real self which we are, we always are and already are, is the innate, natural, effortless, automatic, unceasing, unassailable sense or knowing, I exist. There is no part of you that doubts or even can doubt that you exist. And so we don't have to look hard for this part of ourself. We just go to the most natural recognition that we can possibly have, which is that right now I am. Whatever I think or feel or experience is thought or felt or experienced as I, the subject, the knower. And so we know that in this universe, everything that exists, everything that is phenomenal, that can be observed, that can be witnessed always has something else that it depends upon, something earlier that is its source. For example, this body you're experiencing depends upon the earth. All the life-giving nutrients and energies of the earth support the body. 
Without the earth, there is no body. But likewise, the earth is supported by the sun. The sun gives its life-giving radiance and light to the earth to create all life forms out of and sustain them. So without the sun, there is no earth either. But even the sun is supported by something. We can call it space. And space is very subtle. So much less easy to identify with the mind because it doesn't have a shape or any objective qualities. But nevertheless, we know space exists and that the sun owes its existence to space, as does everything. So in the same way that even the sun, which is the source of life, is depending upon space, is supported by space, go back to the feeling of I, I am, I exist, and really look and ask this question. What is the I am sense being supported by? What is supporting the feeling you have, the knowledge you have, you exist? How is it that you know you exist? What is in back of I am? if you connected to that which is supporting the sense I am, many of you may have just had a kind of realization or an insight that you can't put words to, you can't describe what it is, but there was a knowing that responded to this question, what is supporting the sense of I am. And that is the truth of self. Much subtler than space. Sri Nisargadatta calls it the absolute. This is the very primordial ground of being that exists wordlessly, even before I am. This is your very being. It is prior to even consciousness. Even consciousness we can understand and know as something that exists. So it must be supported by something even earlier and even subtler than itself. That is how invincible your being is. It is invincible because it cannot be found 
It cannot be touched, and yet it is undeniably the truth. You are undeniably that truth. So if you want it, come and get it. Come and be aware of it. Come and know you are that. Live from that place. Engage every thought from that knowing. My being is unassailable, unapproachable, unquestionable. Heaven and earth may pass away. The body will pass away. Space and time will pass away. But my being is forever. My being is the very pretext upon which all of these things depend. I am the earliest. I am the subtlest. Even before the notion of I, I am. now abiding as that knowledge I am, effortlessly, simply, tranquilly, just being what you are. Take a deep breath into the body, witnessing the breath, knowing the breath, and a deep exhale. Opening your eyes when you're ready. So just curious, how many of you had an experience of that? Were you able to get a sense of what we're pointing to when we say that there is something before I am? Otherwise, how could we know I am, right? If there wasn't something back of it, supporting it, from which it emanates, yeah? Can you feel that? It's not something the intellect will get, right? But it's something the heart knows and feels and senses. And when we connect to it, that overwhelming sense of peace and well being is um, what's the term? Basically synonymous, right? It's impossible to, to connect to that part of yourself without knowing. Ah, all is well. I am all that is. What do I have to worry about? You know, I'm just here to experience, to deepen, to grow more into the awareness of this perfection that is inside of me. And so everything we do is to this end, you know, to, to practice this presence, as we've been talking about. When you spend moments throughout your day, just, you know, maybe closing your eyes, going inwards and connecting to the presence of the Almighty and feeling that ground of being, feeling that peace happening within you, knowing that you are the very source of all existence at the deepest core, right? At the deepest core of what I am, I am all that is. When we connect to that, that's, that's the spiritual muscle that we're working towards building so that maybe, you know, I sit down and it takes me 30 to 60 seconds before I feel that connection happen. And I do that three, four times a day, 
you know, as often as my memory allows me to remember to do that, I do it. And then as time goes on, each day I notice it takes me a little bit less time to connect to that knowing. I can close my eyes eventually, and within two seconds, I can feel that atom bomb of bliss happen as I connect to the knowing I am. I am eternal. I am perfect. I am the infinite. And the more we harness the ability to connect to that ground of being, the next step is we actually start to live from that place, right? Where we actually don't have to take moments to pause and remember to go inwards, but we're kind of being pulled inwards by the immensity, the gravity, the overwhelming wonder of that knowledge. It becomes the most important knowledge. It becomes the most interesting knowledge. And you just can't keep your attention away from it for too long. Just like being in love, right? When you're truly in love with someone, you can't stop thinking about them. Well, you have the most wonderful possible existence already within yourself, your very being that is more lovable than you could ever imagine. And so you can fall in love with it to the extent that you lose the ability to be in any other state, but it has to be practiced. You have to devote yourself to it, right? Practice the presence, practice the awareness of oneness. And that muscle starts to build itself to the degree that it will flex itself all the time. You'll just notice you're writing emails or walking down the street to the mailbox and something's just pulling you inwards. That intimacy, that, that love you have for the self that you are, for the universal being, just keeps pulling you inwards like gravity. It's a very beautiful, uh, exciting, adventurous way to live life. And as far as I've found, the only water that really satisfies. <laughs>